It's uh, Jason Bradfield from the uh, UCLA Rhythmia Center EPS Division is going to speak on cutting edge electrophysiological strategies for heart failure. Thank you everybody for coming. I want to thank Dr. Dang for inviting me to speak on behalf of the Arrhythmia Center. Um, I don't want to thank him for making me follow Dr. Fonero there. Uh, it's always a tough task. But um, I will speak today about something that we are obviously very fond of at the Arrhythmia Center, which is advancing the field and uh, finding cutting edge ways to help our patients and to help our heart failure patients. We are lucky enough to work with a great group of cardiomyopathy physicians and anything we can do to help their patients uh, we are always happy to do that. <laughs> this is only about a four-hour talk if I go through all these things, um, but I'll try to keep it to the, the 20 minutes and let me start my timer there. The, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that we could talk about in terms of preventing sudden death with ICDs, biventricular ICDs, and I'm happy to speak about many of those things offline uh, because we have a limited amount of time, but because the topic is cutting-edge technologies, I wanted to talk a little bit about managing ventricular arrhythmias because obviously this patient population has a lot of uh, ventricular arrhythmias and they have defibrillators that go off and they get shocked and we want to improve their quality of life by minimizing those therapies. Um, ways that we can minimize the risk of those procedures and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, something that we're very interested in which is neuromodulation as a new and innovative way of uh, modulating ventricular arrhythmias. Um, some technologies that are on the, the uh, forefront for AFib ablation, which uh, to this point it hasn't always been a great um, strategy for heart failure patients because of the progression of their atrial dilation, and then perhaps also ways of preventing stroke uh, with interventional therapies. So as you guys know, you know we're a ventricular tachycardia uh, ablation center, and that's kind of our, our focus. Um, but what we found is that many ventricular arrhythmias don't come from the inside of the heart. And, so the reason we get so many referrals is because, unfortunately, when you only map the inside of the heart, uh, you may be missing half of the circuits that you are required in order to have a successful ablation for someone who comes in with recurrent ventricular arrhythmias and shocks. And this was first described by Dr. Sosa in Brazil, um, where he takes care of a lot of Shogg's disease patients, and those patients have a lot of epicardial substrate, and he kind of pioneered this technology of percutaneous epicardial mapping. If you look at tertiary care centers, the, the percentage of times uh, patients have epicardial mapping for the ventricular arrhythmia is somewhere around 20 percent, and that's largely been in the non-ischemic population because the sense to this point has always been that non-ischemics have more of an epicardial uh, arrhythmia substrate than endocardial as opposed to ischemic patients. Uh, and I'll show you some data from our center perhaps uh, contraindicating that. But in the community, the uh, percentage of time patients have epicardial mapping and ablation is much less, in part because of training and the, the training that's needed to do that safely and effectively. Uh, we have certainly a referral bias for epicardial ablation because many of our patients come from uh, other places where they've had a previous attempt at ablation. Uh, but there are EKG criteria that we can use to help guide us in terms of knowing whether something looks epicardial. Many of these criteria are all about the QRS width and the slurring of the initial portion of the QRS. Um, so we can use that to help guide us to whether it might be a better upfront strategy to go to the epicardium and then endocardium as opposed to an endocardial ablation alone. This is an image from one of my uh, recent papers that is just there to illustrate the complexity of, of ventricular scars. For those of you that, I wish I had a, a pointer, but the, or maybe we do it here. No. It's a little hard. The, uh, if you look, the, this is a 3D electroanatomic map of a non-ischemic patient's heart. The inner shell there is the endocardial surface, and the outer shell is the epicardial surface. The colors indicate, purple indicates normal tissue, and red indicates scar, and those other colors in between are the, the regions of voltage in between normal and scar. And what you see is that uh, on the left side of the screen is the lateral wall, and, on, and in the middle of the image is the septum. And what you see is that there's a red area there in the middle, that's the septal endocardial scar, and there's a big large area of epicardial scar on the lateral wall. And had you only mapped the inside of this heart, you would have only seen a very small percentage of the scar. And this scar was, this VT was actually involving both scars and traveling through the mid-myocardium uh, between regions where you see no scar on either surface of the heart. So the importance of being able to map both sides of the the, the surface 
I think is really uh, illustrated here. So how do we do that? We have to get into a very small space that doesn't have much fluid. Uh, this is not uh, pericardiocentesis from tamponade where there's a large amount of fluid. There's less than 50 cc's in most uh, normal hearts uh, in that space. Um, and so we have to get into that area without causing collateral damage to things like the liver, the lung, um, the you know, GI system. <coughs> And in order to do that, we use what's called a TUI needle, which you see down at the left lower part of the screen there. And we uh, advance that under the, uh, under the xiphoid. And when we get close to the heart in fluoroscopy, we inject a little bit of contrast. And you can see that dark staining there. That's actually from the tenting of uh, the pericardium. And then when we pop across very quickly, you have to be quick enough to pull your needle back so that when the right ventricle comes at you, you don't hit the right ventricle. And then you see our wire advancing along the left lateral border of the heart there. Once you can demonstrate that you go, excuse me, along the left lateral border of the heart and then across the transverse sinus, then you know you're in a safe place that you haven't gone into the, the heart. And then we can advance a sheath into the pericardial space and use that to manipulate our mapping catheter to make a map like that one that I showed you there. So we recently published our uh, epicardial experience, which is the largest epicardial VT experience in the world uh, in heart rhythm uh, last month. Um, and interestingly, the kind of theory to date has been that non-ischemic patients need epicardial mapping maybe early on as opposed to ischemic patients. But what, what we found was that actually our ischemic population that got epicardial mapping as well actually did better than when they only had endocardial ablation alone. And admittedly, that's probably in part a referral bias because many of these patients come with previous failed ablations. Um, but it's interesting nonetheless, and I think it um, brings up some interesting uh, concerns because these patients are, the ischemic patient population we're dealing with now as opposed to many years ago is different because they've been intervened on quicker. They're, they've had stents, they've had, uh, their infarcts aren't as extensive, and so um, the, the scars are different now than they were many years ago. Uh, and it brings up the possibility that we should be intervening epicardially earlier than we uh, used to. So, like I said, getting into the epicardial, spa the ep epicardial space to map and ablate is not a simple thing, and uh, only limited centers have that much experience doing it. And so what we thought about is, there, are there ways that we can help minimize that risk so that this can be more applicable in the community? Um, and one, uh, so there's a number of ways that they can do that, and there's all the different kinds of catheters being uh, evaluated, fiber optic, uh, pressure sensors, a catheter that can pull uh, the pericardium away um, from the heart to try to uh, put the needle in, and uh, a direct visualization, and then a technique that we used, uh, and I'll show you a picture of here, trying to uh, use current technology, something that's actually available on the market to try to help improve safety. So this is actually, uh, on the top left you see uh, an endocardial map, voltage map of the right ventricle, and on the, right next to it is a CT scan, and then we fuse those together on the top right, so the, ma our, the map that I made with a catheter is on top of the CT scan, and we then put all the other organs, like the liver and the <clears throat> sternum, back on, on top of everything. And then we attached our epicardial needle outside the body to the 3D mapping system. And this has never been done uh, before. And we use that to guide our access uh, to avoid, if you see the point going into the heart, obviously you've gone too far, in hopes that that could be applicable in the future for other centers. Let's skip over this one here. The, um, Next thing I wanted to talk about is the autonomic regulation of uh, ventricular tachycardia circuits. The, the sympathetic tone uh, has a powerful influence on ventricular tachycardia inducibility and sustainability and generation to ventricular fibrillation. And for many years it's been known that interventions that affect the autonomic nervous system can reduce VT and VF. And this has been seen in patients with long QT and recurrent ventricular fibrillation. Uh, what's called catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, that if you intervene by doing something called stellate ganglionectomy, you can actually reduce their arrhythmia burden. However, the autonomic nervous system and the interplay with the cardiac system is very complex, and so we're still learning a lot about this system, and it's, a, it's an idea that's been largely 
kind of ignored over the years, uh, but it's an area of interest for us and we're continuing to uh, evaluate this. And as many of the uh, physicians here know, we have uh, gone to this technique for ischemic and non-ischemic patients uh, by doing stellate ganglionectomy. And that initial experience uh, was with left stellate ganglionectomy, where uh, we have the surgeons come in and remove the left stellate ganglia, which you see uh, on the top right, a specimen. And then we published this in circulation uh, in collaboration with a couple of centers in India where we saw that you know, if you take out the left stellate or do thoracic epidural anesthesia in patients that are having ventricular arrhythmia storms, that you can actually reduce their burden of ventricular arrhythmias. So this is an additional therapy that can be used in combination uh, with, with ablation or in patients where ablation may not be possible or they have polymorphic arrhythmias that are not amenable to ablation. Um, and so we saw some initial benefit with that. And then, let me skip over these just in the interest of time. We, as our research in this area developed, you know, it's not, doing a left stellate isn't perfect and obviously uh, we said, well, what about the right stellate? It uh, innervates a large portion of the heart as well. And Dr. Uh, Ajijola uh, fr from our group also uh, published the bilateral data now that we've been doing with bilateral stellate ganglionectomy showing, again, here, pre and post stellate ganglionectomy decrease in the number of therapies uh, per day with uh, these interventions. Obviously, these patients are very sick, and we may never, in many of them, we may not make them arrhythmia-free, but if we can improve their quality of life by decreasing the frequency of uh, defibrillator shocks, I think we're doing them a, a certainly a service. How else can we intervene on the autonomic nervous system? The, there's been a lot of real interest in renal denervation for the treatment of hi hypertension, and uh, a lot of those studies, uh, there's few more studies coming out, and that's probably going to become a, a standard treatment in the, uh, for resistant hypertension. Um, but what about for arrhythmias? There's some data, there was one paper published in, in combination with afib ablation showing that renal denervation in combination with pulmonary vein isolation decreased afib recurrence. And so a group of us, including some folks from Maryland and from New Jersey, are put together a case series that's in, in progress looking at what about these ventricular arrhythmia storm patients? Can we help them with renal denervation as an adjuvant to, to uh, ablation or stellate ganglionectomy? Um, and it's a small series, but we've seen some preliminarily good results. Um, you can uh, see here, this is from our patient that was included in that series. On the left, you have renal angiography. And on the right, you see the ablation catheter in the main uh, renal artery. And we deliver uh, spiral or circumferential lesions in each of the main renal arteries. Uh, we're using a standard ablation catheter. Many of the studies that were in Simplicity and the other studies that are for hypertension is a special catheter made by one of the companies. Uh, we're using a standard, uh, in our case, irrigated ablation catheter, but others have used non-irrigated. Um, and, you know, this patient had came in with VT storm. We didn't do another ablation in her, and she did well for about five or six months. Eventually, she did have some recurrent therapy uh, from her device. So it's not perfect, uh, but it's something uh, cutting edge, you should say, that we, you know, we're working on to try to help these patients in a relatively minimally invasive uh, way. Now, what about uh, left atrial occlusion? There's been a lot of um, interest in uh, left atrial occlusion as a way of helping patients that have AFib. Uh, that are at risk for stroke and maybe can't take anticoagulation. Um, and there's been a number of different er technologies for that. The Watchman has gained, gained a lot of uh, interest, and this is a device that's deployed in the left atrial appendage. Um, but we're interested in ways of uh, minimizing uh, leaving foreign bodies in, uh, in the left atrium, and so we're looking at an epicardial approach that we'll be initiating soon called the Lariat device, and I'll show you some quick pictures of that. Um, on, on the left, top left, you see a transeptal catheterization and an angiography of the left atrial appendage. And what you do is you put a, a catheter into the appendage that has a magnet on it, and then on the second image, you see a second catheter touching it. That's an epicardial access, and the catheters actually come together with the magnet. And then you deliver in, uh, on the top right the Lariat device, which basically cinches around the appendage. You tighten it around it. It's a suture external to the appendage, and you leave, and then you pull out the catheters, and you leave no foreign bodies inside the heart. 
So it's a non-surgical way of ligating the left atrial appendage. And Dr. Bush from our group is uh, kind of be leading the way on that, and we'll be starting doing those procedures shortly. So in the heart failure patients that maybe have AFib but can't take anticoagulation, uh, this may be a good option. <clears throat> and the early studies were promising in terms of success rate. Obviously, we'll need further studies to, to see uh, in a bigger picture how things go. Um, the final thing I wanted to talk about is um, AFib ablation. I think one of the, for the heart failure population, AFib ablation has been not well utilized in part because these patients are sicker. Uh, being, sitting through these elective procedures maybe isn't always in their best interest. And AFib ablation, in large part, while it's been more effective than antiarrhythmic medication in the patients studied, um, you know, it's not a perfect procedure. The success rates are 60 to 70 percent, if, if you're honest, and uh, uh, for, a, for a single procedure. And um, for a heart failure population, maybe their atrial disease is more progressed. Um, we're doing some, uh, we're part of some studies on what's called firm ablation or, or focal impulse and rotor uh, mapping, which is a technology that uses a basket catheter in both atria to try to find where poten potential rotors may be that might be driving the atrial fibrillation. So the goal here is, is there a way that we could do AFib ablation more successfully and with less ablation and less time than with current technology? And I think it's promising. You know, the jury's still out. The early studies uh, look good. Uh, but if, if we could do that, and, and instead of just doing kind of an anatomic ablation like you see here that we do for standard uh, pulmonary vein isolation, perhaps AFib ablation would become more applicable to the heart failure population because we could get in, we could find rotors, we could map them, get, you know, terminate them and get out and help the patients that, you know, need it most. And here's, uh, you know, this is actually proprietary software, so I can't explain to you exactly how they make these maps. We put a, a basket catheter in the atrium, it collects all the data, um, and it gives you this color scheme of activation, much like the maps we make uh, currently, and it tries to, and you try to determine where those rotors are, and then you go to that area on the, where the basket is. Uh, one of the limitations for heart failure patients at this point is uh, that the baskets aren't probably big enough for most heart failure patients. We need to get bigger baskets that can oppose the atrium well enough uh, because if they have a dilated atrium right now, you can't have this uh, technology. But as the technology improves, I think that won't be a limitation. And this is the early uh, trial from CONFIRM, which showed uh, in red you see the event-free survival for the standard pulmonary vein isolation patients. And at two years, you know, the event-free survival is only like 40 percent. But in the firm ablation uh, or, or firm guided group, the um, success rate was much higher. So it's promising, it's early, uh, but it's something that we're excited about and may have some benefit for your patients. You know, in summary, I think there's uh, numerous ways that uh, electrophysiologic mapping and ablation and interventions can benefit heart failure patients. Um, for treatment of ventricular arrhythmias, for treatment of atrial fibrillation to minimize the risk of stroke, um, and of course the standard things that we talk about like defibrillators and bioventricular ICDs. Um, and we are always very happy to participate and are lucky to, to work where we do with the group of people that we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bradfield. We